take it away, Federico. Okay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you for everyone who turned up. Okay. So this is our third lesson. Um, this time we have quite a few more references. And <laughs> let's begin. So we begin with a little bit of a quick recap of last time. Uh, last time we defined we define an averaging operator, which was defined it's an operator that goes from functions to functions. And yeah, then if your graph is D regular, then your operator is going to be related to the adjacency matrix. It's one over D the adjacency matrix. And in particular, it is symmetric and it has so it has and it is diagonalizable and has n eigenvalues. And we said that the second eigenvalue is important. And in fact, this is because we have a theorem that says that these graphs are expanders if and only if there exists a uniform upper bound on the second eigenvalue. That is, the second eigenvalue is a bound away from one uniformly over the sequence. And we said also that this averaging operator represents the evolution of the simple random walk on the graph. And that is one of the way of proving this theorem. Okay, and then we went to look for explicit constructions and so we specialized to the schreier coset graphs. And the good thing of the schreier coset graphs is that, well, they are two S regular graphs that are labeled. And so we can use this labeling to decompose our to decompose our averaging operator as an average of orthogonal operators. That is, we have an orthogonal representation and we just take some averages over the generic, some averaging over the generic set. Okay, and why was this good? This is good because then there exists magic, which is property T that has a terrifying definition, but it's just magic. And in particular, property T in this case will tell us that if you have a group with property T, then there exists a constant, just a priori is associated with the group, so that for every choice of subgroup, the associated Schreier graph will have this upper bound on their uh, second eigenvalue. So any choice of a residual sequence of subgroups will provide you expanded graphs. Okay, so that was the quick recap and now we start the new stuff. And this lesson is all about coarse embeddings of metric spaces. Okay, so now X and Y would be metric spaces, no assumption on them. And we say that a, yeah, a coarse embedding is a function function f from x to y such that there exists two functions rho minus rho minus and rho plus that are functions from the positive numbers to the real numbers which are increasing and unbounded And these functions are called control functions. Okay, and what do they do to these control functions? They control the, dis the displacement of the metric. That is, these functions are uh, such that for every x and x prime in x for any pair of points, you can estimate the distance between their images. So the distance in y of f of x and f of x prime is at most rho plus of the distance in the codomain and it is at least rho minus of the distance of x x prime in the codomain that is these control functions are telling you by how much you are distorting the metric when you when you map with f and so if you want equivalently, F is a coarse embedding 
if and only if, if you have any two sequences of points, XN, XN prime sequences, then you have that the distance between XN and XN prime is bounded. Well, it's uniformly bounded. If and only if the same holds true for the images. Okay, this is an equivalent point of view. So if you prefer more sequences, you just say that sequences that can fellow travel, we go to sequences that fellow travel and, and it's an if and only if. Okay, this is the definition of course embedding. And I think you all know some examples of course embeddings in particular. The example is that if f from x to y is a quasi-isometric well, value, quasi-isometric embedding, then it is a course embedding with control functions, say, for plus, well, so that this is an LA quasi-symmetric embedding, then rho plus, which I mean, both control functions are linear functions and rho plus is just given by LX plus A and rho minus is given by one over LX minus A, or maybe let's forget the name T because X is point. Okay, so course embeddings are a slight generalization of quasi-asymmetric embedding. And we are interested in course, uh, and by the way, the notation will be arrow with a CE on top to be course embedding. Okay, we are interested in uh, course embeddings into Hilbert spaces. And uh, not such screaming yet. So we're looking for maps from X to H Hilbert space that you should think of the space of square integrable integrable sequences. So N to of N. And the reason why we're interested in such thing is that spaces slash groups that do admit such course embedding, course embeds into Hilbert. And let's say that cannot be too wide. That is, if you assume you have a course embedding into Hilbert space, then you can sort of use it to try to do something with the metric on your group, because like Hilbert spaces are very nice spaces that just Euclidean space just so happens to be infinite dimensional and you can do nice analysis on it. So if you have a way of embedding your group inside such a nice space, then you can hope to do something about that group. And in particular, this has been used to prove that the course bound con conjecture holds true. Yes. So example, they satisfy the course bound con conjecture, which is a rather terrifying analytic statement, but it has important consequences. For example, it implies, the, I mean, for the spaces where it holds, it implies things such as the Novikov conjecture, which relates some topological invariant and some analytic invariant and et cetera. So, I mean, this goes into more hard geometry, differential geometry and analysis. But anyway, this means that these spaces and groups are nice in some sense. And what, well, yes, so let me now give you one example of a course embedding of Hilbert space, which is easy to write. And it is given by trees. So if you have an infinite tree, 
then it will admit a course embedding to Hilbert space. And this is easy to see. Is choose an orthonormal basis. So for the Hilbert space, so if you have E1, E1, E2, etc. These are unit vectors that are orthogonal. That is the scalar product E i, E j will be equal to one if i is equal to j and zero otherwise. Okay, you can choose such an orthonormal basis. Uh, what do we do? We choose a root on t, on the tree, and we send it to zero. And now for every edge on the t, we associate it with a, one of these elements of the, of the orthonormal basis. So, so add well, okay, let's say associate one element of the orthonormal basis. So let's say we have a bijection between elements, between edges and elements of the basis. Um, and then the map is just defined by adding up all the edges. You start working from the from the root, so the root you send to zero. And then here you have the edge, which is say it's associated with the element one. And so we say that walking this edge is, gives, it, gives you a plus E1. So that this vertex would be sent to the vector E1, while this vertex would be sent to the vector E2 because it is a plus E2, et cetera, E3. And then say this edge is determined by plus E4, so that this vertex is going to be E1 plus E4, and so on. You just exhaust the tree by adding up these. Basically, at each time you choose one orthogonal direction and you move in that orthogonal direction. And that direction is orthogonal to anything that happened before and anything that will happen afterwards. And the claim is that, uh, we claim that uh, this F is that this function that I just described from the three, the Hilbert space is a coarse embedding. And the proof is very simple. And it is just that, well, if you have two vertices in the T, um, they say their distance is equal to K. This means that you can go from B to W by walking along K edges. That is, it means that W is going to be equal to B plus E1, EI1 plus blah, 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 plus EIK. This is walking around. That is, in other words, the distance between this is not T, this is F of W, this is F of T. And this is saying that the distance in the Hilbert space between V, F of V and F of W is equal to the component given by walking around, which is just equal to square root K. So in particular, we just show that in this case, this F is a course embedding with control functions that are equal to F. Rho minus of t is equal to rho plus of t, and that would equal to square root of t. Easy. So, three is course embedding three best spaces. Um, more generally, one can show that if a space X has finite asymptotic dimension. then there exists course embedding into Hilbert spaces. And also if X has what is called use property A, which is 
the slogan is that it's a non-equivalent version of amenability. Anyway, if you have this property, then again, there exists a course of many into Hilbert spaces. And what we will show today, that is uh, the main objective of this lesson, is that um, if there exists, well, if there exists a sequence of expanders, and say that it isometrically embeds into X. And we are, of course, graphs are metric spaces. With the path metric. Anyway, if you have a, a metric space X and the sequence of expanders that isometric for which each element of the sequence isometrically embed into X, then X does not coarsely embed into Hilbert spaces. Uh, Federico, uh, sorry, th there's a question. Uh, do trees quasi-isometrically quasi embed into Hilbert spaces? Okay, I, I, would, I think so. I was think, I, I asked myself that question while preparing this lecture and I think they do, but I didn't check the details. So I think so, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I think they do. Basically, the thing that I would try to do would be to, instead of picking one orthogonal direction, we just pick a direction that kind of go a little bit on the same, like for which the angle is more than pi half. And uh, I think that being the Hilbert space infinite dimensional, you might be able to choose elements so that you do get this kind of linear interfacing. But I'm not completely sure. I didn't check the details. Maybe it's nonsense. So. But it's a good question. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. So, so there is another question because we've already stopped. So there is the f of f of w and oh, oh yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter, I guess, because you just replace v and w and yeah. That, those two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. I'll, I'll answer this question in the chat. Okay. Um, okay. What comes next? Yes. So now we start doing this. And um, yeah, let me point out that this statement is uh, is said often, and it sounds scary. So people don't. I mean, many people don't actually know how it's proved, but the proof is actually quite simple. And so we're going to do the proof in pretty much full detail. We only leave out one little bit, which is an exercise. So this is what we're going to do. Okay. So um, the slogan is that expanders do not course in embedding to Hilbert spaces, but uh, there is a caveat. So what does this mean? Because each, L, so each finite graph does embed. So because for each n, the, the nth graph is finite. So there exists a course embedding, which just sends everything to zero. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you are in the thing that we want to show now, that is if you have GNs that are isometrically embedded into X and X coarsely embeds into H, then we get by composition Uh, we get some coarse embeddings of G n into H with not just coarse embeddings, they are uniform coarse embeddings. Well, uniform just means that the control functions rho minus and rho plus do not depend on n. And what we will prove is that the claim if G n is a family of expanders, expanders uh, then there exists no uniform into Hilbert spaces. 
So this is what they're going to prove. So we fixing the control, basically we fixing the control functions and we show that you cannot, there will be some end for which you cannot squeeze it inside the Hilbert state with that control function. Or another way this thing is said is that if you try to embed uh, uh, expanders into Hilbert spaces, the distortion becomes worse and worse as n increases. The, dis the metric distortion of the embedding. Okay, so we need the following. Easy fact of which I will say some things later, uh, which is that that G N be a family of expanders. Well, let's say the regular expanders. So again, today we use the deregularity because we are going to use the spectra criterion of plus 10 that works well for deregularity, but this is not necessary in general. It's only necessary for us because we didn't introduce the right language. Um, okay, so we have a family of deregular expanders. Then there exists some positive constant kappa such that for every function from Gn to well, the reals uh, with zero mean, it's zero average, so the sum of all the vertices is equal to zero. We have uh, the following inequality that the sum over all the vertices of the squares of f. Uh, well, this is a Hilbert space, so square of the norm in the Hilbert space. Uh, this is at most kappa times the sum over all. So this is on the nth graph. And by the way, the constant kappa does not depend on n. But anyway, this is at most kappa times the sum over all the edges of the differences between f of b and f of w square. And this is a very important object and this is called the Poincare inequality. And if you want, the slogan is that uh, you can control the average of, well, you can control the average norm of your image in terms, in terms of the average local displacement. Okay, and take some time to appreciate this because like you have some graph, which is just like a priori is just something random and you have some absolutely random function that is sent inside some Hilbert space. Uh, G n of B, uh, yes, good question. This B is not doing anything, sorry, B in G n. Uh, thank you. Anyway, what I was saying is that you have this graph and then you have some random function inside some Hilbert space and Say that of this function, you just know what it does locally. It is like if you know what it does at one very specific vertex, then you have a little bit of an estimate to what happens in its neighbors. This very small information, if you are an expander, is enough to give you some global information about how the function looks everywhere. And this is a very powerful tool, as we, as we will see now. In fact, this thing will let us prove quite easily our claim. So, the proof of the claim. So the claim is that there exists no uniform course embedding of expanders inside a Hilbert space. So assume by contradiction that we do have a uniform course embedding of a sequence of expanders with control functions rho minus and rho plus that are fixed. So we are fixing some functions and we want to produce a contradiction. 
And without loss of generality, we can assume that these functions have zero average. This is just because if they don't have zero average, we can just subtract the average. So this is my oops. just like replace f well fn with fn minus the sum of fn of p. And since I'm just doing some translation, this doesn't spoil the embed the, the metric properties of the map. So you can assume that these functions have zero average, which is what we need to apply the Poincare inequality. Okay, uh, now we fix n and we remark. So if you have two vertices, and if you have an edge, well, if you have two vertices, they form an edge, even only if their distance in the graph, I say these are two vertices in the nth graph, they form an edge even only if the distance is equal to one. But then they tell us that the, if we apply f to them, since it's a coarse embedding, we have an upper bound on the distance between the images. So f of b minus f of w is at most rho plus of one because f is a coarse embedding. And the important thing is that this estimate, this constant, is independent of n. OK, but now, now we just apply the Poincare inequality. Because this thing here that we have is precisely what goes on one side, on the right-hand side of the Poincare inequality. So just assuming that we have an upper bound on the, uh, on the distances in the image will tell us that the sum over all the vertices, I mean, the sum of the squares of the norms over all the vertices is at most this constant kappa times the sum over the edges, well, let me not write it. Well, okay, I'll write it. The sum over the edges of fp minus fw squared. And this is just by what we just said is at most kappa times the number of edges times this constant rho plus of one. And if you want, we can estimate, we know what is the number of edges. This is kappa times uh, d, the degree times the, well, should be the half, the degree times the cardinality of gn times rho plus of one. We don't particularly care. What we care is that this thing is, well, what we care we write in the box. So in particular, we have that the average, so the average of the square norm, so one over gn of sum b gn f of norm square of f of b is at most uh, some constant c, where this c is just our d square g n rho plus one, which is constant. And this does not depend on n. And at this point, you can already see that we must be reaching a contradiction from here because we have these graphs, these are I mean, graphs have become larger and larger, and so we have bigger and bigger diameter. And then, and then we know that if we assume that there are coarse embedding, then the average of the norm that you get is bounded. Basically, you are managing to squeeze this infinite thing inside 
a bounded ball, which is clearly nonsense. So the, the only way to, I mean, the only thing we have to do to conclude the argument is to say that, um, I mean, is to pass from the average to some more specific thing. But I think the, the thing, the, what I'm trying to say is that just applying the Poincaré inequality at this point, we basically proved our claim. Then the rest is just a little bit of details. So this was the important bit. Basically, having a Poincaré inequality it immediately gives you this uniform bound on the averages, which becomes nonsensical. So this was the important bit. And now there's just a little bit of extra detail to complete the proof, but it's nothing to be worried about. And actually, it will be sketchy. Uh, so, Federico, so sorry. Not, uh, just yeah. like, uh, can you uh, scroll up a little bit to the inequality? Um, uh, so there was f supposed to be a function from gn to uh, a helper. Oh, sorry, 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 okay. sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah. that's just oh, excellent, excellent point. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, oh. they satisfy a Hilbert Poincaré inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, There's also a question. There's a question in the chat that I. Uh, I'm just going to ask it, but I didn't have time to think about it. <laughs> was that sum being called an average and the without loss of generality part a finite number? Can we really minus it? Uh, so yes, I mean, because like now we fixed n, so this is a finite sum. So. Sorry, Mark, that you forgot to uh, get rid of the gn on the right side of the constant. I the, forgot to get rid of the GN. Where? Uh, in the average, the box of uh, inequality. You divided by. Uh... Yes. Oh man, I've been making a few mistakes. And I also forgot the kappa. Okay, so now it is constant for real. Um, any other mistake? Also, the blue circle. Uh, the blue circle seems fine. Need to divide by GN. Um, uh, you need that's an average, right? So you need to divide uh, by mod of GN. Uh, yeah, no, okay. This is not quite because I mean, the point is that the, the condition I need for applying the Poincare inequality is this stuff here. And so I want, you're right. Uh, all right. Yes, I think you're right. I want to remove the average. Thank you for pointing it out. You see, I am very bad at doing computations because despite what might look like, I really am a geometer. Okay. Um, anyway, yes, we remove the average value so that then we do have, then when we take the sum over G n, then we get zero. So yeah, we are removing the average. Really, thank you for pointing it out. Okay, um, right, if we took care of all the mistakes, now we can go forward. Okay, so again, I was saying that now it would be a little bit sketchy and say that, so we know that the average value of f of the norm square is some constant c. So this says that, um, let me just say for most, b in gn, you will have that the norm square of f of v will be at most 1 billion c of v. Just one random constant, big constant. And, in, and it follows that for most, for some most large enough, pairs b, w in g, n, also the distance between well, we have that the distance between f of v and f of w, which is at most the sum of f of v and the norm of f of w. Uh, well, let me say a square, we're looking at the square thing. This is at most four times is billion times c. Anyway, some constant. The important thing is that we have that for most pairs, their distance is constant, which 
is quite clearly giving us, going to give us a contradiction. And this is because now, so far we only use the upper bound, the upper control function on the course embedding, but we're also, for a course embedding, we're also asking that things that are far away go far away. So now we have to use the lower control function. That is, since Fn are uniform course embedding, well, let's just say, yeah, course embedding, anyway, we have that there exists some radius r big enough such that pro minus of r is bigger than this constant we have. So four times a billion C. Okay. And now if n is large enough, since our graphs we go since our graphs are large, I mean, they, tend, they, they become larger and larger and they all have bounded degree. We have that if n is large enough for most pairs, the w in gn, their distance in gn will be greater than r. This is just because the ball of radius r in g to the n, so, the ball of radius r around any point b has cardinality at most the degree times r plus one, which is finite. And since our graphs become larger and larger, if n is large enough, this degree r plus one is ridiculous. And so most points are far away. Uh, but now we got a contradiction because this implies that for most pairs of points, the distance between the images uh, oh, I lost the square. Well, anyway, the distance within the images should be greater than rho minus of r, well, square. I was too generous with the constants, but anyway, this way is much bigger than four times a billion c. And this is a contradiction because it was supposed to be smaller equal than that. And, and that's it. So basically, having graphs for which you know the Poincare inequality immediately implies that they cannot course invert in the field of spaces. As soon as you have bounded degree graphs that become larger and larger and satisfy the Poincare inequality, then there's no way you can do that. Uh, can I it. ask, do, do, uh, if you take GN to be an N cycle, does the Poincare inequality fail? Uh, yes. Um, Is it clear? Um, yes, because you can coarsely embed into Hilbert. I mean, you can coarsely embed into R squared. So, like, you you can have like the, the distance. Yeah, you can you have a function from the cycle. Well, maybe I can write it. Uh, okay, if you have a cycle. Then there is a function from the cycle inside, let's say, R squared, which is a subset of the Hilbert space. And this function is just given by, well, I just thrown it. Like this is the image of the graph. And this is so that each edge is at most one, but the average, I mean, the norm of, yeah, the average norm of F is this distance that increases Rate, uh, increases linearly with the radius? Yes. So f of b will be roughly equal to n, well, so if square then becomes n square, where roughly equal means linear, while the distance is one. Was this your question? Yeah, yeah basically it is, Poincare inequality really is a uh, notion of expansion. Basically, Poincare inequality tells you that it's most of the graph is unexpanded in some sense. So I should say, quote unquote, that like there might be some non expansion somewhere, but like the majority of the graph 
look like an expanded. Like these highly connected in some sense, which is not quite as precise as the as the Chica constant, but like on average, it's like an expanded. It doesn't make much sense, but like the Poincare inequality is really tightly related with some notion of expansion on average. And the on average word comes because we always take like the sum over everything. So if you have a very, very big graph in which you have like a small bit, which is not very highly connected, this will break your trigger constant, but on average, that is very small, so you don't see it. And the Poincare inequality tells us about stuff on average. There's also a question in the chat, uh, okay. how you make the most of something arguments fully rigorous. Um, you, I, I mean, you just, the proof. You, you write the numbers, so okay. So the, the most that is less figured, so, okay, there are a couple of mosts. So this most here is sort of rigorous because I said that the bolus for any point, the bolus reduced R around it is, has volume bounded by this constant, uh, which means that, I mean, if you have to pick two points at random, you can also assume that one is fixed and then pick the other point at random. And then there will be uh, these many choices that live for which the pair has small distance and all the other choices for which does not have small distance. So with overwhelming probability, if you want, the point will be far away. And actually, you can be a little bit more precise and say, uh, well, in fact, um, the generic pair in an expander graph has distance, well, on the GNF expander graph, has this distance between P and W roughly equal to the logarithm of gn which by the way is as large as it can get because you can show that the diameter of an expander graph grows logarithmically with the with the size of the graph so anyway these these sort of explain how to make one of the most rigorous like if you really want to make rigorous you have to write numbers and i prefer not doing that and for the other most it's just um, if you like probability theory, this is called the Markov inequality, but in practice, it just says that, well, since you know that basically you have a sum of numbers, which are say positive numbers, which is sum of positive numbers is at most some constant C, this tells you that the, the number of those A so this is not a, a, AI. The number of those AI such that AI is greater than, let me see, instead of C, let's say one. If you have a, a sum of uh, some numbers that add up to one, then the number of those that are bigger than, say, constant A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, epsilon is at most one over epsilon. Because, uh, yes, because if you have more than one over epsilon of them, when you add them up, you get more than one. See, I mean, you have to take the sum over all the things. Basically, if you have an upper bound on, okay, I guess I should say average. Uh... Okay, no, this one I did not. This one did not come up well. But if you have a, a sequence of numbers whose average is equal to something, then the amount of them that takes a value that is much above the average is bounded by the fact that the average must be equal to that thing. Do we have to say more? Yeah, let me say more. Let me say more. Uh, okay, so I just want to say that uh, I, the the person who asked the question, Cosmos, appears to be satisfied. The person so, who asked the question is satisfied. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So if you would like to. <laughs> okay. 
yeah uh, because yeah yeah good because it's very easy but the easiest way to write it is as i mean in my mind the easiest way to write is an integral so that is probably not the easiest way to you and so i'm struggling to find what is the easiest way for you but it is very easy um yeah like intuitively it is obvious like if you have that that's why i took the the big constant the billion here i took the billion to make it intuitively obvious while if you take like twice is i mean two c is already big enough but the billion makes it obvious okay all right so this was completing the proof that given Poincaré inequality with values in the hilbert space thank you for pointing it out then we cannot course embed in the hilbert space and now we would like to show this easy fact um, okay, so a proof of the easy fact. The first part is an exercise, and it is that expanders satisfy an R valued Poincare inequality, which is uh, the same kind of inequality, but where so that is there exists a kappa independent from n, so that for every function, and this time the domain really is R. So for every real valued function with zero average. You have the Poincare inequality. That is, the exercise is to show that if you have a sequence of expanders, then there exists a constant kappa that depends on the spectrum of the expanders, so that you have to go back to. Um, like this is an easy exercise. Uh, it's an easy exercise and it follows easily from the spectral characterization of expanders. That is. Once you know that the second eigenvalue is bounded away from one, then it is fairly easy to show that if you have any function that there exists a constant kappa, so that every function with zero average, every real valued function with zero average, satisfy this sort of inequality. And it's an exercise. And basically, the, the key point to make this inequality, I mean, it's written as a hint in the problem sheet, but the thing is that this right-hand side is very much related with A of F minus F, where A is the averaging operator. Basically, looking at how F changes when you do this averaging, like looking at F and then doing at the average of the neighbors and picking the difference of this, and uh, well, the norm square of this, this difference is very much related with the sum over all the edges where pretty much is the same stuff up to constants. And this is what you need to do to translate this inequality inside a statement about the spectrum of the averaging operator. And so the control you have on the second eigenvalue will let you prove the inequality. So the easy piece. Okay. So basically the R value inequality follows directly from the control we have on the eigenvalues. And then to see that the R value bunker inequality implies the Hilbert value one is actually very easy as well. And the point is that if you have a function from G in sense of Hilbert space, then you can decompose the function using a orthonormal basis. You have A1, A2, blah, blah, blah. Orthonormal. This is of the Hilbert space, then you can write f of b as some sum. So you can write as f1 b e1 plus f2 b e2 plus blah blah blah. So you have this infinite series. And the important thing for us is the quality that the norm of f of b is the norm of f of, b, f of b as an element in the Hilbert space, as a square, is equal to the series of the squares of these components. Okay, so this is basic functional analysis. So you can compute the norm on the Hilbert space by adding up all the coefficients, the squares of the coefficients after you decompose it in order to normal basis. And once we have this, then we're done because 
we have okay, back to our Poincare inequality is something that looks like this. So we have to estimate sum over the vertices of f of v square, but this is equal to well, double sum we decompose it this way and we swap the order of summing. So it's equal to the sum from i goes to what from one to infinity of f g and f i of v square. But now this is a real valid function. For, for every fixed i, this is a real value. And we do know that we have the Poincare inequality for real value functions. So this is smaller or equal than the constant kappa times the sum. And then there is the sum over the edges of fi of v minus fi of w squared by the real Poincare inequality. And now we do the same because we use the same inequality once again to deduce that this is actually equal to kappa times the sum over the edges of f of b minus f of w squared. So basically, is the easy exercise that is proving the real Poincare inequality. And then just by decomposing a function in terms of its coordinates, you can extend this inequality to the Hilbert value Poincare inequality, which was what we needed to deduce non course compatibility. And this conclu concludes the proof, the full formal proof of the fact that expanders do not personally bend into Hilbert spaces. Um, and this brings us to Gromov monsters. And the question was, do there exist groups such that admit expanders that are isometrically embedded into the telegraph? And the theorem by Gromov is that, yes, there exist. And so it's proved by Gromov's with details added by Arshan Sevader Sand. And there is an alternative proof by Osider. And OK. And the uh, and these groups are called Gromov monsters. So when you hear Gromov monsters, it means some groups whose telegraph contains expanders. So in particular, of course, as a corollary, we have that such gamma does not have finite asymptotic dimension, nor property A. Because we started today's discussion by saying that these two properties imply that there exists of course embeddings into Hilbert spaces, while a ground of monster contains expanders, so it doesn't course with embedding in Hilbert space. And then there is a theorem which is much harder and that shows that uh, these provide counterexamples to the course found con conjecture. course, but this is much harder. Okay, uh, I had a couple of remarks to make, it's fine. Yeah, and it is that the original construction of Chromo uh, doesn't give isometrically embedded expanders. Uh, only what is called weakly embedded. Which is a weaker notion that is enough to prove the corollaries and the theorem. But anyway, Osida's construction, Osida's construction does, does give you isometrically embedded expanders. And both constructions, constructions use graphical small cancellation. Uh, 
And small constellation is a technique for building hyperbolic groups and with some prescribed properties. And both constructions use this kind of techniques. So they produce hyperbolic groups with coarsely embedded or isometrically embedded expanders. And for both of them, an important ingredient is that you cannot actually embed any expanders you want. An important ingredient is that you need expanders with larger girth. Where the girth is the length of the shortest two. Uh, non trivial non trivial shortest loop in the graph and and the large actually means that the girth of gn should be at least as large well it should be linearly large with the diameter of gn where where the constant c does not depend on n okay and then i was hoping to say quite a few more things but i am running out of time so let me see what i can say for the moment are, are there any questions uh you should keep talking okay, <laughs> okay um hunting for large girl uh, what I want to say, well, let me just write this. Well, let me write a couple of things. So if you have a free group and you have a sequence of normal subgroups of the free group, um, and you have them such that their intersection is just the identity element, that is free group, uh, subgroups that become smaller and smaller, uh, then it implies that the Killy graph of the portion uh, and uh, have girth that going to infinity. And this is because I, I was hoping to prove it, but I don't have time, so we just wave my hands. Um, this is because if you fix a ball, if you fix a radius r, and you want to say that for n large enough, the girth is at least r. And so Look at the ball of reduced R around the origin in the Kelly graph of the free group, that is a tree. And now, since you have the condition that the intersection of all the normal subgroup, subgroup is trivial, there exists an n large enough that does not, that only intersect this ball at the origin. Like all the other points would be away from this ball. But this is telling you that if you take then the projection onto the portion of that, this ball is sort of isometrically embedding into the projection. And in particular, you don't have loops of length at most r around the origin. And then since the subgroups are normal, the Kelly graph is homogeneous. So not having loops around the origin means that you don't have loops anywhere. So you do have large curve that goes to infinity. And let me see, let me see, let me see. OK, that's enough for this. And then we need to find expanders with large girth. And it is a classical fact that you probably know that if you take these two matrices, A and B, that is 1, 2, 1, and 1, 2, 1 inside SL2, then they generate a free subgroup. And this is just my ping pong lemma. And, OK. And then, and then we can look at the subgroup of the sort. We can look at groups of the sort SL2, Z mod TZ. And, okay, and it's a hard theorem, but it's true that these kind of groups are expanders. Well, they clearly graphs. And this really is hard theorem. Uh, it depends on heavy number theory, at least the, the original proof. Um, Okay, but since we have our free group that is a finite index inside SL2Z, 
then one can show that, I mean, by, yeah, we have three group that is sits inside SL2Z and then projects down to the quotient SL2Z mod PZ. And one can check that this map is also subjective. And so this is saying that we have some Kelly graph of SL2Z mod PZ with respect to the set, generating set given by the free group, that is pi A and pi B. That is, we have this set that generates this thing here, does not generate this thing here, but it generates again the quotient. And so you have some Kelly graphs. And it is not hard to prove that these things are expanders. I mean, given the hard theorem, it is not hard to use. I mean, since these groups have finite index, since the free group has finite index in S to Z, it is easy to use the hard theorem to prove that these uh, Kelly graphs are expanders. Okay, and uh, yeah, and these are Schreier graphs of the free group because I mean, we started off by this thing here. And so we do know that these graphs have girth that goes to infinity by the argument here. But as an exercise, the last exercise, you have to show that uh, in fact, if these are your graphs GP, then the girth of GP is linear with its diameter. And this follows by using expansion. And I'm out of time, so I will stop here. I was hoping to see a little bit more, but that's it. And so if there are any questions. So first, let's uh, thank Federico for the lecture and for the whole very nice course.